here we are again. I just wanted to give you guys a little uh, shorty on uh, solving problems. Uh, I, it's, it's not about solving all problems. It's only about solving uh, one or two problems, or you know, when it, just the way that I solved one particular problem. We get ourselves in trouble sometimes whenever we go into a job that we think is going to be really simple. You know, nothing to this. You know, how hard can it be? I've done a lot of these. It can be something as simple as uh, getting uh, fouled up trying to take wheels off and having the lug studs turn or, uh, you know, you know, because of the gall uh, lug nut on its threads or something like that. Um, and I, I remember one time when I was working at a Volkswagen place back in the early 80s, uh, we routinely did uh, certain jobs, you know, like timing belts and uh, valve adjustments and that kind of thing. And I had a job that came in one day <coughs> about... Well, I drew the ticket about 20 after 4, and we shut down at 5 at that dealership at the time. And I said, uh, uh, it was a job that paid like three and a half hours, you know. It seemed like it was a time of a valve adjustment, something else, I don't know what it was. But anyway, uh, I said, well, I'm going to see how far I can get on this thing uh, between now and 5 o'clock. And so I flew into that thing, and I started working on it, and... Uh, I don't even remember how it all happened, but it flew together so fast. You know, of course, I knew every step to take and every tool I needed and all that, just like it is when you're really familiar with the job. And uh, when it, uh, when I got done, uh, it was like 5 o'clock, and I started that thing up, and I was through with it. I said, man, I got these things down pat now. I can really crank me out some labor hours. Um, and I was patting myself on the back and all. And the next morning, and that job went out fine. It didn't come back on me. All the work was done. Everything was up on the up and up. The next morning I drew a job that was exactly the same job on a different vehicle and it took me four hours to get it all done because it fought me every tough step of the way. And sometimes, you know, some jobs will fight you and some jobs just kind of sail on through, which is one of the deals. Um, but sometimes something that seems like it ought to be a really simple job can turn into a monster. Uh, and uh, this is uh, particularly if nobody's been doing, the, uh, doing the, any work on the car for a long time or if the thing you're trying to do. This is an example of that, sort of. Uh, but what we got to do is we got to be able to think on the fly to fix this stuff the right way as quickly as we can. Um, all right, what we uh, had here, you know, some of them sneak up. A lot of the stuff is simple maintenance. Um, I don't know if you recognize this or not. This is actually on a uh, Ford Fusion hybrid. Uh, and if this particular fuse is blown or that little connector is unhooked, you'll get a charging system fault and all that, you know, of course. Uh, I don't even know why I chose that picture, but it's just kind of fun to do. Uh, that was actually one that we worked on in 2010 when I was up at Craig, Craig Van Battenberg class, and Joey Henrik was on my team. It's kind of funny because I chose Joey Henrik since I was a team leader, and everybody got mad because they wanted him on their team, but I got him on mine. So anyway, anybody that knows Joey Henrik will know why I'm saying that. Um, but uh, the fuel filter replacement uh, is neglected by some people and maintained religiously by others. The fuel filter is typically the last thing we think about. I got really tickled here uh, a couple of years ago. I drive a 2006 Explorer that I inherited from my wife when she bought herself a pickup truck. But uh, anyhow, uh, this uh, Explorer came in that, was, that we did a lot of work on. It was an 08 model that had like 300,000 miles on it and still ran like a sewing machine. And, uh, but she got regular oil changes and maintenance and stuff. And I said, you know, we probably ought to check our fuel filter because uh, you know, she, we hadn't looked at it in a long time. She never thinks about it. We don't. So we pull that fuel filter off and try to blow through it. Man, it was just, just locked up like a brick. Surprising the car was even running. I mean, the Explorer was running as good as it was. And then a couple of days later, we got my 06 Explorer in there. And I said, maybe I ought to check my fuel filter. It was just as bad as hers, you know. But we don't think about fuel filters a lot of the times unless there's a problem. And uh, so that's one of the things right there. Um, Ford... Uh, fuel filters have got these funky little things where you have to spread those fingers in there. Now the problem with those is they get all clogged up with dirt and crud. Most everybody that's listening to this has done much mechanic work and if they've taken a fuel filter off of a Ford has seen this before. And so basically uh, what you got to do is you got to spray some carburetor spray and uh, or anything, uh, PB blaster or whatever you want to up in there before you ever begin to start to take that thing off. Uh, especially if there's a lot of dirt and grit around up in there, uh, but I like to do it anyway. Spray it all up in there and just wet it really good up in there and then get your shop air and blast it really good and get any particles of dirt or grit or sand out of there that you could possibly get out. 
and then you might even want to lubricate it again with your little bit of PB blaster and go in there. And usually you can just pop that thing right out of there. Now, occasionally, uh, back when they first started putting these kind of fuel filters on here, they had these uh, little, you know, stainless steel fingers grabbing a hold of the, uh, the line when you put it in there. Uh, people would get a fuel filter that didn't have the long stems on it, and they would click that fuel line on there. And it would be just so dead gum close to the filter, there's just no way you can get any kind of tool in there to get it unhooked. Now, it doesn't leak or anything, but when it comes time to change it, you got to hacksaw the dog thing off there. Hacksaw it off, and then after you hacksaw the uh, end off the filter, you know, where it is, then you can put your tool in there and get that thing out of there. I've had to do that several times. Or somebody's got a fuel filter, if you like BI-8, they didn't think about it, click, you know, put it on there like that. And so, anyway, uh, these little sets of tools are pretty handy. You can buy them just about everywhere. There was a long time, you know, the Fords originally sent us these plastic ones here, a gray one and a blue one. And they're okay. Uh, I like these a little bit better uh, for the most part. Uh, some of them, you have to get a special one like this to work on some of the GM vehicles because they got a second ridge up there that you got to work around to get down in there. And one of these tools won't work for it. Okay, so when well, you get the dirt and all out of there, that little stainless steel retainer will release and all. Uh, and in response to the tool, you can remove the filter. Now, there's some yay who may have already been there and messed it all up. And that's real aggravating, too, if you got to fight with a situation like that. I don't know how many times I've had to do that. And then I've had other mechanics come over there and say, can you help me take this fuel filter off, you know? And uh, a lot of the times, if somebody can uh, find, help get you to help them solve a problem, they won't even try to solve the problem themselves. They just want to get the job behind them and move on. And I don't know what the mindset is on that. I ran into that when I was in Texas working on uh, heavy equipment and stuff and this uh, crane mechanic that was 55 years old, I was like 22 at the time, he came and he says this alternator is not putting out on this crane out here. And uh, you know I, we had 10 cranes, I didn't know how all they were, you know how each and every one of them was wired up and they all memorized. And I said well how, does it got an external voltage regulator or an internal voltage regulator? And he said well it's, uh, uh, it's uh, internal. You know, he just, I don't know, he just seemed like he thought about it a minute and he came up with that. And I said, okay, um, well, do this and this. You know, I told him what to do, to, what to check. And I said, if it doesn't start, I mean, if it doesn't start charging when you do this, if it's got power here and all, then bring it, we'll let Oliver rebuild it. So we sent it to town, Oliver rebuilt it, it came back, put it back on there. Still wouldn't put out, he's trash talking Oliver, you know, who does our, our rebuilder work on our starter and alternator. And I said, um, let me go out here and climb up this thing. Look, so I climbed up on the track and I climbed up on the, cat, the catwalk out there outside the crane housing, went in there and there was a voltage regulator, voltage regulator there and there was an oil pressure switch that turns on that voltage regulator, basically goes to the light circuit, you know. And I said, why did you tell me this thing was an internal regulator when it's an external regulator? And so that oil pressure switch has got exposed terminals on it and there was power on one side. I just crossed it off with my pocket screwdriver and you could hear the engine hook or down low when it started to charge. And this not had didn't even know enough about the charging system. And so he comes to ask me, you know, and I'm less than half of his age. What's up with that? Anyway, and he had been working on equipment for a long time. Anyway, now this is my Ford pickup. My, uh, the way it works on my 06 F-150, which is a little bit different. I don't, I don't, I don't know what year model this is on, but it's pretty handy to do that. You know, you can uh, actually watch that more than once if you want to, but uh, that's basically uh, we can try that again. Let's do that one more time. All right, you got to pop that center out, and then you push the outside, and then you get the filter out, and then when you stick it back in there, it clicks back in, you push it all back down, and you're in Fat City. And that was right there. So don't break retainers or fuel tank hose connectors. Be really, really careful. A lot of time I've said something, you know, you give uh, one of the younger people in your shop the job of changing a fuel filter, and disaster strikes. You know, or uh, what's even worse is if you've got them pulling a fuel tank off and they're not aware of all the lines and hoses that are hooked to these plastic nipples and stuff up there. And sometimes they'll break a part that is very, very difficult to get without getting a gas tank. And it's kind of difficult to patch that too because then you wind up with all these evaporative leak system codes and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's a real drag. But what uh, somebody's got to be paying really, really close attention because a lot of the stuff... They, well, they'll have these little plastic parts of, of various different things. They'll break one or lose something, and they'll say, uh, well, we'll just get another one in the parts store. You don't just pick up the phone and call Advanced Auto Parts and order some of these parts. They're just not available. 
Now, more of them are available than used to be on your help board and stuff, but, but, but not breaking it is smarter than breaking it and feeling like it, I'll deal with that later, you know. All right, so. Now, kits are available, but not for everything. What I used to do when I would get a fuel filter that would have extra retainers and all, is I would save all those dadgum retain retainers. And I had a box that I had used all the heat shrink out of, you know, a box like this one you see back here. And I would put the, uh, I actually started putting all of those spare retainers and stuff. And sometimes I'd buy uh, new retainers and I'd uh, build myself a little kit. A lot of times you can build yourself a kit cheaper than you can buy a kit. Sometimes you can't, but uh, one way or another, there will always be retainers you don't have. No matter how many of these little suckers you put together, you're always going to find something you need that you ain't got. Now, GM cars use a filter that can be removed with wrenches, but there's O-rings on the tips of the line, so you can be careful with that. It's, GM cars have been like that for, well, longer than some folks have been alive that will be watching this video, I imagine. Uh, the old uh, TBI uh, pickups and all that, and other, and, you know, the other cars with TBI and all, have a fuel filter like this on there, and you had to use a couple of wrenches to break the line loose. and, and uh, get it off there, and but you had to pay attention to that ring, o ring or you'd wind up with a uh, with a leak, um, and that's pretty simple. Some of these will have a, a fitting like that on one side and a click fitting on the other side too. Now the otherwise routine Toyota Camry fuel filter replacement that we're going to talk about now turned out to be a nasty mess, and here we are, you know, you, and also you're downing the car, which means that whenever you're through with this job, the car's or if you're not through with the job and there's a problem so that you can't finish the job, the car's going to be sitting there until you're done. And uh, whenever I was uh, running that automotive department over there at the college, I was always trying to get these guys to move with the cadence that you would at a regular shop. You know, we'd do a brake job in an hour, hour and a half at the most. And all changes we'd do in like 30 minutes and that kind of thing. And I was typically checking behind them pretty good to make sure that some of you didn't uh, put a cheater pipe on the oil drain plug and turn it the wrong way until it was sort of turning around and around. That has happened. But, you know, mm. anyway, so this one has a banjo bolt on the top and a flare nut fitting on the bottom. There's your banjo bolt fitting right there. Looks like that one right there. Uh, the, the, and this was, uh, you know, you got your two washers and you got your hollow bolt uh, that goes through the top. And then on the bottom, you just had a regular old flare nut fitting. All right, so Chrysler's been putting their fuel filter in the tank as a part of the fuel pump module for a few years now, uh, like on some of the mid-90s. Uh, Dodges and Chrysler and vans and stuff, they would have the fuel filter would be a most last life of vehicle. It was a big old filter, it kind of looked like a little miniature air filter being in the bottom of the tank. Uh, of course, they have various different ways this is dealt with, but the filter that the little sock, the little nylon sock that's on the uh, intake of the uh, fuel pump uh, is just typically supposed to stop uh, little particles of crud from getting in there and fouling the pump. Um, I don't know how many times I've actually had one come in where somebody had replaced the pump. It ran a little bit and then it quit running. And then I found out the, fil the pump was locked up. It wouldn't move because when they were putting the pump back in there, uh, they would manage to lose the, uh, the sock. The sock would come off while they were putting the pump back in the tank. They just run it like that. Uh, one time I had a car that was an 88 Cavalier, if I remember right, GM car. And that one there, when you would stop the car, it would stall. And I noticed that also when you'd back the car up, it would stall. And what was going on there was the filter had come off of the pump, and the, the pump, that, that flat bottom part of the pump, was really close to the bottom of the fuel tank. And because of the fact that the fuel tank had, had a tendency to oil can with the weight of the fuel, whenever I would stop and the fuel would slosh forward, the, uh, the bottom of the tank would oil can up and just come perfectly seal off the pump. And the fuel pressure would go away and the car would stall it would also do that backing up and that was because of the, the sock had come off the filter now that one didn't have a piece of dirt get in there and foul the pump but it had a problem for other reasons uh, anyway that's another little thing uh, you got to have a detail oriented person that's doing that kind of work or you got comebacks now it would seem simple so simple Toyota doesn't tell you the Toyota does not provide specific instructions for fuel filter replacement Important related procedures are discussed under service precaution, right? How hard can it be? There's where the little sucker is, right down in there on the Toyota we were working on. The 94 Camry on the driver's side shock tower. So he got the banjo bolt out easy enough, 
but couldn't get the fuel line on the opposite end to break loose. It was a plain old flare nut, not even with a six point flare nut wrench could it be moved at all. And I've tried it myself, I was like, oh really, how hard work can it be? I'll take care of this, you know. Well, it didn't work for me either. The more we fiddled with it, the worse things got, the more we rounded it off. Now sometimes when you got one that's trying to round off, even if you got, even if you can only get a regular, on a regular, uh, like sometimes when you're trying to break the lock nut loose on the tie rod end, you know, and you're bouncing on it. I had a real strong girl in my program one time and I had her over there pulling on a 7 8 wrench to break this uh, uh, tie rod lock nut loose and, and she was spreading the uh, tea, I mean the jaws on that wrench. That's how hard she was pulling on it. Now the students that were trying to initially work on it had sprayed some uh, PB blaster on it because they thought it was locked up with rust but it was just really really tight. And so what I did is got some valve grinding compound and I smeared it on the jaws of the wrench and then it grabbed the thing and broke it loose you know. Sometimes you got to do that with this. You can do it with screws and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the diesel guys, what they'll usually do is they'll take their <laughs> they'll take their socket, dip it in oil, and throw it in the sand, and then they'll let sand do that job. You know, because they're working on stuff that's typically bigger, and crustier. All right. Before we cut the line, which I knew we were going to have to do, I called Toyota. There's no repair kit, and a fuel line would be more than a hundred dollars. Now, this is not good. So we need to figure out some kind of way to take care of this problem, right? All right, so we cut it off. We didn't have any other choice, so it wouldn't come loose. There it is. We cut it off with a high-speed cutter. Um, uh, thankfully, we had a fire extinguisher nearby, so in case it started a fire, that we could put that out. Of course, we didn't start a fire, but we managed to get it off of there. We had to do something, you know. So we needed a reliable, professional way to put a new fuel filter on it because this is important, that this thing not leak and that the car is drivable, there's all kinds of stuff going on here that we have got to really pay close attention to. And whatever repair we come up with better be a good one. All right, so what we did was this fitting right here, I got this quarter inch pipe to three eighths hose fitting. And those threads right there, as I tried them, they went really nice up into that fuel filter, nice and whatever you tighten them up in there, they were good as nice. I could tell it would work. Now the thread wasn't exact, but the thread was close enough. And sometimes you'll have that. It doesn't usually happen, you know, like for example, 10 millimeter bolt thread, 3 8 uh, US standard is uh, close to the same, but they won't interchange, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, this one here, it was nearly the same pitch as the metric fitting on the fuel filter, so we went with it. Now, while pipe threads tapered to seal, it's got, it's littler here than it is there, so the more you screw it in, the more it gets tighter. These threads match the filter really well. We couldn't get the right flare nut at the time we were making the repair and this car needed to go. Now this was not going to be no hack patch job. We were going to do a really good job so that we wouldn't have, they wouldn't have trouble and the next person hopefully would be able to get the fuel filter off without any issues if the fuel filter was ever changed again. Because this was a filter that came on the car and it was a 94 model and this was probably in like 2014. Alright, so the flare nut presses this inverted cone against a matching shape seat in the mating fitting. Understanding that kind of thing is really important if you're going to do something like this. You can't just go in there, you know, and just screw something in. It feels like a... One time I said, uh, I told the guy that I wanted a uh, one-eighth uh, pipe plug. And um, he didn't know what I was talking about. The guy at the parts store. And I think he was the manager of that parts store. So I sent the part that it was going to need to screw into and he sent me back a brake line fitting, flare nut fitting. And I said, uh, I don't need that. I need one eighth pipe. And I said, don't you know what one eighth pipe is? He said, well, I screwed that in with my fingers and it seemed to go in just fine. Well, that's not the point. I still needed a one eighth pipe plug because I needed it to taper and seal, you know. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, uh, I got the uh, one eighth, quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, and put all of those in a little box. I got each one of those, I mean, little fittings. I didn't have a plug like I needed or a fitting or whatever it was. But I did put him some stuff together and I sent it up there with them all marked so he would know what that was. He didn't know what pipe fittings were, with all due respect. I don't guess he'd ever been exposed to that. Anyway, so it'll work in spite of its taper. This one would. The nut holds the line flare against the matching cone in the mating. Now, quarter inch pipe thread's close enough. We cut the barbed hose pipe off the nut. Cut it off real smooth and flat like it. Now we got us a nut. Got us a nut with a hole through it, right? Okay, now there's a little step in here. That's got to be gone. 
Now this is brass, so it's fairly easy to work with. It had to be drilled out. So we drilled that out to make it nice and smooth on the inside, right? All right, so it would slide through it. That's what we wound up with. We wound up with a perfect hole for the line to go through, and we had a nice little nut that was going to work just fine. Okay, we double flared the line, and then we were able to attach the line to the filter. We used an old double flaring kit. You can get these things just about anywhere. You got to make sure, though, when you're doing a steel line, that you grab that line really good and tight uh, with your with the holder, because if you don't, it'll try to push the line back. A double flare that's not done right is useless, so make sure you double flare it. And the double flare actually does this, and then it bends it down, you know, which is what went on here. So that's a nice little double flare, and we've got us a factory perfect deal. But in order to do this, we actually had to cut the, the 90 degree piece of line off so we could get it out here in the vise and work on it, okay? And so we had to deal with that too. That's where we had cut it off. And so we used a copper tubing union, and on this line, this uh, 10 millimeter line, a 3 8 copper tubing union works just fine. Now you don't ever want to use any of this stuff with brakes, because a copper tubing union is not a good way to repair a bake line. You need two double flares, and you need a union that's for double flares. That's how you fix brake lines. Uh, but for a fuel line, it's not going to have no more than about 40, 50 pounds of pressure on it. <coughs> and this copper tubing union worked just fine. All right. Here's some questions. Technician A says spark knock, ping, and detonation are different names for abnormal combustion. All right. Technician B says any abnormal combustion raises the temperature and pressure inside the combustion chamber and can cause severe de engine damage. Which technician is correct? Ding. Both guys. Both of these guys are correct on this one. All right. What can be used to measure the alcohol content in gasoline? A. Graduated cylinder. B. Electronic tester. C. Scan tool. B. Either A or B. If you got an electronic tester, that's fine. A graduated cylinder works. Uh, we'll cover that later maybe if you don't know how to do it. But um, moving on. A flex fuel vehicle could be identified how? VIN, vehicle emission control, uh, you know, VCI decal. Uh, emblems on the side, front or rear of the vehicle, all of the above on various vehicles. A lot of these flex fuel vehicles don't have the emblems anymore because they kind of got a bad rap. But the VIN, uh, vehicle emission control decal, it will have it. Uh, so. You know, you could actually use any of these, but if it doesn't have the emblem, we had two cars in our fleet at the college that were flex fuel vehicles, and if you didn't check the VIN number, you wouldn't know it. One was a Dodge Caravan, the other one was a Dodge Stratus, and both of them were flex fuel. <coughs> Technician A says the use of premium high octane gas in an engine and design to use regular grade gasoline will increase engine power. <coughs> Wrong. B says that flexible fuel vehicles are designed to operate on gasoline or gasoline ethanol up to 85% ethanol. Uh, who's correct about that? That's technician B. Now, premium high octane gas burns a little bit slower. So, what the problem is with that is because it burns slower, if the vehicle set up to run on 87 octane, it can leave fuel deposits in there that turn into carbon that take up space in the combustion chamber and make it start pinging when it wasn't pinging before you started using it. There's technical serv service bulletins from Ford and Chrysler about that uh, that I had found years ago. Sometimes, if you put uh, 93 octane fuel in a vehicle is made to run 87 octane. It'll fall on its face when it's cold and stumble and do all kinds of stuff. And I can tell you some stories about that too. But one way or another, if it says 87 octane, that's what you need to run. You're not helping yourself out putting premium gas in it, except to spend more money. All right. Uh, number five. Which of these is added to a fuel for testing purposes to avoid problems with the variation of gasoline? Xylene, methyl tertiary butyl ether, enolene, or TBA? Uh, Indoline is the answer on that. Uh, I got a funny little story there. One time whenever my daughter was really little and my uh, oldest son was just a baby, I was on his Volkswagen Bug. I was living in Port Arthur. And I had a 40, 50 bucks in my pocket, but I wasn't even paying attention to the gas gauge like a ding dong. And I passed this gas station, and about a quarter of a mile past the gas station, uh, the car ran out of gas. So I got out of the car and I uh, had a little can with me, and I walked over there to this uh, the back door of this building that had Texaco Research up on the top of it, and I banged on this door that ordinarily I'd have a key code to get into. 
and this guy with a white lab coat came to the door. And I said, I'm out of gas over here. I said, I got some money to pay for some, but I need something. I need some, some help some kind of way because I got a couple of little kids in the car. You know, the car was about 50 yards away behind me with my daughter. My, she was like five years old. My son was a little bitty baby. And uh, the guy says, hang on just a minute. He went and got me this glass jar with a big cork in it, and it said toluene. And he says, uh, here, pour that in there. It'll run off that. And I said, well, this guy's at Texaco Research, and he's wearing a white lab coat. I guess he knows what he's talking about. So I poured that stuff in the car, and it fired up, and that thing ran better on that than it did any kind of gas. Well, anyway, I drove back down to the uh, gas station and filled up, and uh, that was the end of that. Uh, one should avoid overfilling the fuel tank because, what? Extra fuel goes into the expansion area of the tank. The charcoal canister may get saturated. The canister may get dry. The extra fuel simply spills on the ground. B is the answer right there. That's where you need to, uh, that's the right answer to that one. Using E85 can result in what? Reduced fuel economy. Now E85 should never be used in a car. That's why we do alcohol testing with a graduated cylinder. We don't want uh, somebody to have put E85 in the car and us chasing a drivability problem that we think is a map sensor or some other hogwash. Uh, so basically fuel quality is really, really important. And sometimes you'll see 60, 70 percent alcohol in there where some yo-yo has said, well, I'll save me some money and squirt some of this in there because they don't know that E85, well, because anybody can buy it. And any, they don't know E85 is not good for a car that's not set up to run on it. All right. The specific gravity, gravity of diesel fuel is measured in what? That's API gravity. Uh, American Petroleum Institute. Uh, winter blend gasoline all of the above. Vaporizes easier, can cause engine drivability problems with the user in warm weather, has an RVP. If somebody has had their car parked for a long time and it's one they don't drive very much, sometimes they may have drivability issues because they've got winter blend gasoline and they're driving it in the summer or, or vice versa, you know, this kind of thing. All right, RVP stands for what? Rigid volatility percentage, read vapor pressure, reconstituted viscosity, petroleum, rested velocity part. Read vapor pressure is a correct answer to that. All right, that finishes it up on another video, and uh, it's time to do the upload, and I really appreciate your time. Y'all come back to see us.